Here, just gold. Cool. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Taiki. I think I've met most of you. By now. <laughs> uh, so my project was on beaked whale species ID. Uh, and so a little refresher on beaked whales. I am now regretting that I made everything come in piece by piece after Steve steel with the last. Uh, <laughs> beaked whales are super weird. They're a deep diving cetacean. Uh, they can dive uh, for up to two hours at a time on their foraging dives. Uh, and they have some species have like overgrown teeth that encapsulate their whole mouth so they can't open it and they just slurp squid like weirdos. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just think that's hilarious. <laughs> but because they spend so much time underwater and they're a relatively small whale, um, they're much harder to study using traditional uh, visual survey methods than a lot of uh, other species that we deal with. Um, but they're great for acoustics because this whole time we can echolocation clicks. Um, and so they're much easier for us to get data on them using acoustics and with our visual methods. Um, this is just like kind of a picture of what a B2 might look like from very far away. So you imagine trying to see that off in the distance. Um, and then I was very, very impressed. Uh, Dolly actually kind of knows what a B2 looks like. I was just <laughs> kind of amazed that these are almost the same picture. Um, so these are what we're looking for. Um, and the nice thing we found is that these echolocation clicks that they make can actually be uh, identified to different species. So that's super useful for us. Um, so some details about my data set. Uh, we have a survey we did in 2016 where we deployed uh, about 30 drifting buoys all across the coast of California. So some inshore, offshore, a lot amongst the Channel Islands. Um, and we have five different species of beaked whales that we're studying for this. Um, there are more than that, but there are a bunch of other species where we have just a tiny amount of data, so we can't really use those for this. Um, and you'll see that we have a lot of one species, about 70%. Um, and these are all times two because our recorders have two channels. So we effectively have two detections uh, for every detection. Um, and then our lowest species down here uh, comprise about like 2% of my data set. So there's a pretty good uh, data set imbalance problem there. Um, and then all of these images are actually part of uh, unique encounters. So when we find a B12, it's going to make a lot of echolocation clicks, but those are kind of the same thing. Um, so that's what this is saying is that we have uh, about 860 unique encounters of different beaked whales. Um, so that's a lot of, uh, you know, a lot smaller than maybe the 200,000 images would suggest is they're not from that many distinct um, applications. Um, so that's what we're working with. And then some image samples. So why do I think that this might be a possible machine learning problem? Um, well, these are the images that we use or not we the trained acoustics people use uh, to tell them apart. So this is a Wigner transform of their echolocation click, which is just like basically a fancy spectrogram thing that gives you really high uh, time and frequency resolution. Because usually there's a trade-off in that when you're dealing with an echolocation click that is very, very short in time, um, that's not really useful. Um, so this gives us an image of the click. So you can kind of tell, right, if I just showed you this one and this one, you would be able to think that those are different things. And so we're hoping that the machine learning algorithm will be able to do the same thing. And which ones are safe instead? Huh? Oh, these are one example from all of the five species. So these are kind of representative images of what we'd be looking for and what the analysts would be looking at when they're deciding what species are which. Um, so moving on to figuring out how I was going to split my data for this. Um, so it's a little bit tricky. Um, so here, this is a garbled mess on the x-axis, but these are all uh, my different drift locations. So on that map, every dot was a different drift. And you can see that a lot of them just don't have a lot of species variety. So I really wanted to split um, and keep entire drifts separate. Um, but doing that was a little bit tricky to make sure that I still have representatives of every class uh, in all of my train test split. Um, so I was talking to Eli about this, and he had a great idea that I just kind of love the concept of. Because um, if you do any random split, you're probably not going to actually get all of them in every class. Uh, so the idea is that you just do a bazillion random splits and you come up with some kind of score metric and pick the best one based on that. So I was shooting for a 70, 15, 15 split. And so I just measured basically every random split. How close was it to that? Pick the closest one. And that's my split. Uh, so I tried that. It was great. It was very satisfying. And this is just kind of a map of what that looks like. So this is just uh, the locations of them. So I just wanted to make sure there wasn't going to be something weird where like all of my test locations were clustered around the channel islands or something like that. So just a visual check to make sure that it seemed at least somewhat reasonable and we are good to go. So off to some models. Uh, the very beginning, first idea I have is just throw this into a resonant 50 and see what happens. 
um, because it seemed like a good enough place to start. And here's what happened. So uh, if you can see here, this is Epoch 3 in our training, 94% overall accuracy. In our VAL, 91% overall accuracy. Uh, so we're done. And <laughs> for your time, it's great meeting you all. Um, uh, obviously, this is, uh, you know, you see this, and it's too good to be true. And that is exactly what happened. Uh, so we were, uh, I wanted to dig in this a little bit because I didn't think that that was a realistic answer. Um, oh, I shouldn't have done this. Um, so I wanted to know, with these metrics, uh, are they real? What am I actually getting out of this? Because it's obviously not able to do that well. Um, and I was worried about my class imbalance problem because I wasn't doing anything about that. So that was a concern of mine. Um, so I really wanted to know what's happening. Uh, so to be able to do that, what we need to do is to actually predict on some data and then analyze those predictions a bit more. So I spent a lot of time making some nice uh, prediction outputs, making plots. So here's my precision recall for my train set. So it looks beautiful. It's great. Um, but here's maybe a better story of what's happening with my validation set. So I have one problem child where it's just doing terrible. The rest are still pretty good. <laughs> still surprisingly nice results. Um, but this one's just, just very, very sad. And then if we look at... Uh, the confusion matrix for that, you just see a uh, numeric representation of the same thing where uh, this class number three here is just all getting lumped into class number two. Um, so it was at least interesting to see that uh, it was consistently getting lumped into the same class. I, mean, I don't have an idea for why that is, um, but this is just what I found after my first round of testing. Um, so another thing I wanted to look at was uh, just plots of what the actual images look like. So this is a plot of the most confident predictions where it's getting it right. Um, so a couple things I want to point out here. Um, first, these couple rows are basically what I was expecting. So I would think that if the model's getting it right and it's really sure, that we're going to see some nice clean pictures with nice shapes. Because when the acoustic analysts are looking at these, this is what they would look for. And they'd be able to be more confident in saying, this is species X. Um, the one that concerned me a little bit is the species at the top. You can see that these are kind of indistinct shapes with lots of artifacts, and those come from the Wigner transform itself. Um, so I was a little bit worried that those classes were not really getting these core signal, these nice neat shapes, but maybe some quieter ones with lots of noise were just kind of getting lumped into that class. So it's something that uh, I was a little bit concerned about and wanted to dig into more. Um, so what did we do? We do some fun stuff. Uh, so I want to try some augmentations, so just shifting them in the X, and then it fills them uh, with some random stuff just to make it harder for the model. Um, what I was really interested in was trying was uh, just blurring the image because I thought that this would kind of reduce those artifacts a bit so the model would be able to focus in more on what I thought was the more important signal. Uh, and then just a bunch of other stuff because uh, I just wanted to try a lot of things and learn a lot of things. Um, so weighting my loss function by class, uh, trying out, I made a new... Uh, loss function that was scaled by the signal to noise ratio of each click because I wanted to see if I could downweight those quieter signals so they'd have less importance on my outcomes. Uh, I became a full-on tensor board boy and I had some fun making <laughs> um, I tried some weighted sampling, so oversampling my underrepresented classes so that they would show up more. So if I could maybe get that sad pink class to be uh, uh, have some better performance. Uh, adding some random parameters to my feature vectors so that um, to see if that would help it. I'm um, basically just trying lots of things that I wanted to learn while I was here and I have access to people like Eli to help me out. Uh, and maybe most satisfying of all, I made a nice fancy config file to be able to control all of these without having to edit any code, which is just very satisfying to me because I'm a huge nerd. Um, <laughs> and the result of all this was, was basically no change. <laughs> It's not exactly no change, but not something to be confident saying like, we fixed it, it's better. Here we go, we're off to the races. Um, so why do I think this is? I have some, some takeaways here. Um, first, I, there's just really not a lot of time to test all these different things and try to tune every little change you're making. Um, and the second uh, is I actually think I was looking at the wrong metrics for deciding when to stop my model training. Um, so I had originally thought that it was finishing around epoch seven or eight. Then after talking to Sarah, I realized that if I look at some more species level metrics while it's training, um, that is actually probably better if I let it run a lot longer. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, some other concerns, I, every, every run pretty much that same species was just not getting any predictions right. So I wanna take a look at the ground truth, but I'm not actually an expert. So I need to talk to some people when I go back to work and see if they 
have some thoughts on that. Um, but really, one takeaway is that it worked a lot better than expected for a first pass. So that's nice to, to have. Um, and then my other thing is that I just feel like I know so much more than I did <laughs> weeks ago, which is just incredible. And I'm just really excited to go tinker with things now. Um, so what's next? Uh, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Second priority is <laughs> Um, and, and then what I really want to do is go back and do some, some data cleanup. Um, so I do have a lot of concerns about having these sort of noisy data lumped in with everything. Um, so I want to look at more how uh, the signal to noise ratio is in, in investigating my in interacting with my air. If I'm consistently getting quieter ones wrong, I can easily filter those out in a systematic way that I can be happy with. Um, and then I want to work with uh, my team to decide what is the important metric for us. Is it precision? Is it recall? Um, I'm not sure for each species what one might be most important for our use case. Um, and then we do actually have an entire extra survey of data um, that we are just finishing processing. So I'll be able to either test it out on that or add some of that in to the training and, and bump up the numbers for our, for our uh, underrepresented species. Um, and then I just want to be able to spend a lot more time trying out all these things that I learned. Um, and then uh, if this works well, it has the potential to save hundreds of hours of work for our team, which I think is great because I love it when people get to spend more time on the fun parts of their jobs using their brain. Um, <laughs> and yeah, uh, I, I do have a confession. I've maybe buried the lead a little bit here. Um, so it turns out we don't actually care about whether an individual click is uh, part of a beach whale or not. Um, so this is just an image of what our acoustic analysts are looking at. And so what you have here, these are the automated detections of echolocation clicks. And this is some information they might see. Um, and the y-axis here is the bearing angle that they're coming in at. So we have two channels where we're able to get an estimated angle. So if you have an animal, it's gonna come in as a line like this green one, because it's coming from the same place. So it's really easy for us to just say, okay, everything here in green, that is one animal. So within that, it doesn't matter what this click is or this click is or this click is in particular, which is what I'm asking them all to do. Really what we care about is the aggregate. Uh, so if I look at some event level me uh, metrics, so if you remember in the beginning, I have about 860 different events that are uh, unique events. Um, if I average our results across each event, we actually do much, much better. So these are on a validation set. You can see I still have the same problem child. Um, you know, if you have 0% accuracy, it doesn't matter how you bump it, it's probably gonna be pretty bad. <laughs> uh, but you'll notice that everything else is zeros, which is great. Um, so uh, this is just simply for every event, adding up the probabilities and then just seeing which one is the highest and then it labels it to species pretty well. Um, so that, that's actually a pretty happy result and I can take that back and we can figure out what's going on here. Um, but yeah, pretty pleased with, with that. Uh, and that's about it. Just want to say thank you, especially to Sarah for organizing all this. It's been amazing. I'd say that for everyone. It's had a great time. Uh, thank you to Eli for uh, wrangling our <laughs> very special working group. <laughs> and, uh, to all my new friends. Um, and that is it. <laughs> All right, question. That was, um, that was amazing. <laughs> the dolly was maybe the best so far. <laughs> yeah, Ethan. Just for clarification, was the spectrogram that you showed that was like super weird um, with like high confidence, was that the same class as the one as like your problem child class? No, that's actually my uh, most populated class. Oh, okay. Seventy percent of my data are these. Gotcha. And for some reason, it thinks that these kind of noisy ones. Are. Wait, so is? But so those what are is, all correct. Yeah, 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 yeah. This, this is my problem. Job. Oh, no, okay. And it's classifying them as M five. They, yeah, get mm -hmm. the cephalodon. Can you remind us of a fraction of training examples you have there of the class? Uh, this is about 70%, I think, 10 to 15% each for these, and then these are about 2%. So that's it. Like the, yeah. But somehow the, the bottom one is, like, iconic enough. The, yeah, that's the bottom right. one's fine. Which, like, looking at the image, I feel like there seems like there should be structure, but for some reason it's getting these two mixed up. I'm, I'm not sure. It's possible also 
the validation set only has two unique events of that species in it because there aren't enough to go around. So if those are happen to be mislabeled or something like that, that's definitely a possibility. Um, but they still have time to look into it. Cool. Other questions? Yeah, turn. Um, uh, I mean, looking at these images, at least uh, maybe some other sort of like classical image processing shape detection or geometry or something on, on these transforms might be a good comparison to might be a good baseline. Uh, I don't know, just detect a circle or a line or something like that. Thank you. So I mean, this morning that they have like some other, I guess it's a random forest based. Yeah. So we also like have a random forest based thing. We're trying to do the same thing, but we are taking like measures from the waveform. So you measure like the peak frequency and a bunch of other stuff and then throw that to the random forest that we have as a comparison. Any other questions? Yeah. Do you pick up audio from many other animals on these hydrophones? Like, I don't know, other dolphins, other whales? And do you think you can sort of adapt this to, to the problems? Are you interested in that or is the group interested in that? And yeah, how does that all work? Yeah, uh, we definitely do. Um, so I think the, the reason we're focused on beach whales for this is because we specifically use these images and because it's this really short click and we've discovered that the clicks kind of have this structure, um, something like a dolphin echolocation click is actually not very interesting. It's usually just a straight line and you can tell these kind of have like a slope or a bend or something like that. So um, this in particular is useful for that. Um, but the whole idea of me coming here is that we think there are tons of other applications for um, a variety of other marine mammals that we can use. So it's more to like absorb the methods and then be able to try something else in the future. Cool. A question. Um, it's hard for me to kind of like vocalize what these images look like. Um, would you be able to vocalize for us? <laughs> uh, it's, it's too high frequency. Well, on that note, these curves and patterns for a given species, they seem to have some structure to them within species. Clustering just within species on what these things look like, could you infer? emotional state or something about the animal or maybe even family pod like maybe there's something cultural about how pods communicate in certain ways like is there any sense of context of what like if the arc bends up quickly or stays pretty straight like is there been any sort of analysis of how many types of modalities with that uh, I have no idea what they, if you clustered them, I have no idea what they correspond to, but maybe there's something that we can start to figure out. Yeah, I I don't think we've gone beyond, like, we know that this kind of curvy shape is this species. And within that, there's a lot of variations. So part of the problem is that you have this whole set of echolocation clicks, but they're very directional. So if the animal's pointed right at you, you're going to get an image like this. But if it's looking for squid over there, then I assume you get something noisier because they're so directional that even if it's in the same place, pointing will give you a much different image. So there's a lot of variation already from that. So I think it'd be really hard to try and come up with anything, you know, beyond just species because there's so much uncertainty. Thank you so much, Vicky.